In the past few years, Adobe has introduced quite a few AI-powered tools and features in Photoshop. While the early versions of those tools fell short of professional standards and quality, many of them are now powerful enough that we should absolutely use them to work faster. From my own experience, the results that you get out of generative AI usually need some extra work. But it can often do a lot of heavy lifting for you, especially in hair retouching, since it can be pretty labor and time consuming. In this lesson, we'll look at how we can quickly integrate these tools into our hair retouching workflow. And when we can't get the results we want with these new tools, we can always fall back on our manual methods. The rest of the course will teach you how to do professional hair retouching manually, but I want to show you how I've been leveraging these new tools, so if you're not using them yet, you can get some new ideas. You can take what you like and incorporate it into your current workflow, mixing and matching it with your manual work where it makes sense. The Remove tool works really well for removing unwanted objects in the frame in a larger scale photography where you are not so concerned with the resulting textures. It's great for erasing distractions in the background in full body images such as cars, cables, people you don't want in the shot, and so on. However, for beauty and hair photography, it still needs improvement. I find that I get cleaner results with a good old spot healing brush or the clone stamp tool for removing small elements like cross and stray hairs. And for larger areas, I like using the generative fill. I'll show you what I mean. I'm sure it may be useful in some instances, like removing an accessory from clothing or a distraction on a uniform background when there is not much visible texture around, but for now I choose not to use this tool in my beauty retouching. The generative fill option will appear in the contextual taskbar once a selection is made regardless of what type of selection tool you use. The selection brush tool is very straightforward. Paint over the area that you'd like to replace or an object to be removed, and include a little space around it to give AI some context. You can enter a prompt, but it's pretty good at guessing what the task is, and at this point I also don't see much adherence to the prompt anyway, so I usually just click Generate. In the Properties pane, you will have three generated options. Click through them and see if you want to accept any one of them in full, or maybe only grab and mask out the good parts of a couple of them. Because we painted over the outline of the face, it got changed in every generated variation, so let's use other selection tools and exclude the face completely. In the past few years, I have been almost exclusively using the Object Selection tool. It is pretty great at guessing what part you'd like to select, even if you outline it pretty loosely. I have it set to lasso mode with sample all layers and hard edge options checked, and the select subject feature set to device for quicker results. Once the initial selection is made, you can use any selection tool to add to or subtract from it, fine tune the edge with the select and mask feature, or feather the edge of the mask created based on the selection. These generated variations appear cleaner right away, with the face fully excluded from our selection. You can see a subtle deviation from the original background color, and this is a common issue with generative fill, but considering how much time this method can save us, correcting the background color is the least of our concerns at this point. I usually choose the generated variation that is the closest to the result that I am trying to achieve and rasterize the layer, or stamp all layers. I then apply the layer mask to this layer to delete the pixels that were not adjusted and keep my PSD file lean. Now I can add a new layer mask, invert it to black, and quickly uncover the areas over the flyaways that I want gone while being careful around the lashes. And this is just one of the options. You can also leave the entire generated variation unmasked, ensure its edges are blending well into the image, clip a curve adjustment layer to it and color correct the background. I choose how to incorporate the generated pixels depending on what will require the least additional work while ensuring the best result. To finish this up, I'll draw in a few new lashes. This is something I always do when finishing up any hair retouching. I add a few new hand-drawn hairs. You will learn more about this in the upcoming lessons of the course. Be sure to download a couple of our custom hairbrushes from the additional materials and downloads page. The custom lash brushes that I am using in the video are included with our MUA retouch panel. Usually once I'm done with a certain area of an image, I will group all of the relevant layers and title the group so I know what it's for. Let's do another bulk hair removal. 
it isn't necessary for this image, but we'll just do it. Just another variation of options when working with selections and blending the generated parts into your image. I again start by using the Object Selection tool to isolate the entire subject from the background. Next, I need to make a selection that includes the hair that I want to remove and some of the adjacent background to let the generative fill know what to replace the hair with. Sometimes the Object Selection tool isn't getting what I'm trying to achieve, so it's just easier to grab the straightforward lasso tool and make the desired selection manually. Now that I have the selection edge right between the hair I want to remove and the model's body, I can intersect this selection and add a larger area of the background to help the generative fill blend the generated variations into it better. Again, check all three variations and choose what I find the closest to what I'm trying to achieve. I almost always get one variation that is pretty good, and the other two deviate from the original image more. In this run, the first one seems to adhere to the outline of the model's chin and neck the most, so I'll go with it. Again, I stamp all visible layers to include the newly generated part. Then apply the layer mask that was created based on my initial selection, and delete the layer that contains all three generated variations. I adjust the outline of the neck and the chin to match it closer to the original image using the Smart Liquify filter. On our Beauty Retouch panel, this button triggers the regular Liquify filter, but it comes as a smart object, so the filter manipulations are adjustable. In this case, we don't need that, so I can rasterize the smart object and apply the layer mask onto it again, and don't bloat the PSD file with redundant information. Then I'll group the layers of this new bulk removal, give this group a name, and we can move on to the next example. Let's do something different this time. Let's make this hair edge a little less tangled up. I'll again use my favorite object selection tool to make my initial selection and expand it into the background. It appears that when you include a chunk of hair in a selection fully, the generative fill will assume that you want to have this hair replaced entirely, just like in our previous example. So let's try a different selection, just the edge of the hair that we want to replace and some background for context this time. I'm looking for a specific look of the hair edge that I couldn't really easily define in a prompt either, so I just keep regenerating until I get something I can work with. This first variation looks pretty good now. So I'll go ahead and do the same steps, rasterize the layer with the successful variation, apply the layer mask, and then reposition it with the transform tool. There are many ways to blend generated parts into my original image. I normally begin by creating a mask that will confine these new pixels so they don't accidentally encroach onto the skin. I again use the object selection tool and expand the selection into the background with the regular lasso tool. Then add a layer mask based on this selection and adjust the mask edges in the areas where the new hair meets the existing locks by painting on the mask. I create a group to move this layer into and reuse this mask. This allows me to add a new mask onto my layer with the generated hair and reveal some of the original hair by painting with a black brush on this new mask. Now this final step is something that a lot of retouchers are missing, and this step alone can make or break all your hair retouching efforts. I always finish my hair retouching work by adding a few drawn in hairs. It's really the best way to blend it well with the rest of the image. There are a few things to keep in mind. Do this on a new blank layer and use a proper custom hairbrush. You might have already downloaded ours from the additional materials and downloads page of the course. Sample the color of the brush from the existing hair and match the thickness and opacity of the brush to the real hair you are drawing over. Make loose strokes that look like flat arches. Each new hair comes out of the bulk of the hair and returns into it at the end of the stroke. I also never hesitate to undo any strokes that don't flow well with the rest and if your drawn-in hairs look too sharp, apply a little bit of blur to the entire layer. You can make it look even more realistic by repeating this cycle a couple more times. Paint some more new hairs on a new layer and add a different amount of blurring to each of these new layers to mimic how real hair looks in photos. And I often add a little bit of dodging and burning in the end to blend the newly created hair with the original even better. You will learn more in-depth about all of these things in the further lessons of the course. They are pretty much the same regardless of how you reach this finishing point. We just can get a lot more work done faster with these new Photoshop tools now. 
I also find that in beauty and portrait photography it's best not to go for absolute perfection with hair. Leaving some cross and flyaway hairs actually helps keeping things more natural. Our job is usually to remove distractions that may take the viewer's attention away from the subject's face. And sometimes clients may request more drastic hair changes. That's when you can leverage all these new tools and finishing touches.